back in a moment. Glad you're back on the program here on Connect With Me on MeTV Fresno. It is a Monday morning. It's kind of an on-the-air, off-the-presses uh, day, but a kind of a community day, too, and a religious day. So a lot going on over the weekend with what happened, of course, over in Great Britain on Friday, and then uh, the historic vote, or not the, yeah, the historic vote over there, but the historic visit also by the Pope in Armenia. We'll talk about that in the second half of our program. Uh, tomorrow's program, I just want to do a little quick programming note, and that is... There is a new exercise gym that opened up in downtown Fresno. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. It'll be a very interesting program. One of the uh, co-owners of that uh, gym is a female. She'll talk about female health uh, and fitness and what to do to exercise properly if you're, if you're a woman and the proper diet. So we'll get into all that uh, during tomorrow's program. In the meantime, the markets are still incredibly volatile around the world, including right here in the United States. This after a historic vote on Friday in Great Britain, 52 to 48. Now keep in mind, these numbers are not final yet, but it was to leave the European Union after 43 years. This shakes up the world economy order imposed by the U.S. after World War II. The Brits deciding to leave the 28-nation bloc. I want to put this graphic up on the screen because it will shock you. This is what happened on Friday. You can kind of read that for yourself. As most people that were in 401k plans, they lost about 3300 bucks on Friday. It boils down to something very simple, my friends. Financial independence. Great Britain voting to break away so it can control its own financial, trade, and immigration future kind of in a sense making its own rules. Well now some people are calling for a second referendum and Scotland may rethink its decision to stay in. Chaos around the world today, even the weekend after, and an enormous snub to the British elite. Here's our report today from the Associated Press. As news settled across Great Britain of its shocking decision to leave the European Union, residents looked to make sense of what lies ahead. Welsh and Northern Ireland soccer fans gathered in Paris for the Euro 2016 soccer championship and shared mixed reactions over the vote. We're better together. There's, there's no point in not having unity. I think we have come so far since World War II and worked together. Brexit's bad. Control your own borders, control your own country before, fix your own house before you can help the rest. After global stocks tumbled on Friday in reaction to the news, Moody's Investors Service downgraded the UK's credit rating outlook on Saturday from stable to negative. The instability is leading EU leaders to press Great Britain to quickly cut its ties with the 28-nation bloc, ending its 43-year-long membership. People have to see the results of Europe. I think that's key. But we need to turn the page. We don't want a vacuum. And it's important now that these negotiations with the United Kingdom start in good faith, but as soon as possible. But British Prime Minister David Cameron announced his resignation Friday and said his successor should be the one to navigate the process of withdrawing. The referendum is also creating waves in Scotland. Although a majority there voted to remain in the EU, Thursday's vote is reigniting the question of Scottish independence. 2014, I voted for the independence. 2016, remain in Europe and feel a bit let down. Mm. Usual politicians tell you what they want you to hear. And next referendum, we vote for independence again. Mm. Only this time it, it will work. Meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of European Union workers in Britain are confused and concerned about what comes next in their adoptive country. This referendum was kind of a slap in the face. It's like you're not wanted by everyone. You're not wanted everywhere. While change may be slow to take effect, over the long term, it's possible many of the estimated 3 million EU citizens living in Britain could lose their jobs or be forced to leave the country. Noreen Nasser, Associated Press. 
All right, back here on the program, uh, 436 Me TV Option 11 if you uh, want to call in and weigh in. But right now, live on the telephone is our very own Bradley Hart from Scotland. It's about, uh, well, shortly after 6 o'clock over there. And Bradley is a professor over at Fresno State Journalism Department. He is over there right now in, well, he was in Great Britain. He's researching because he's writing a book over there, uh, another book, actually. And now he is in Scotland where Donald Trump just spent the weekend over there. So, Bradley, let me ask you a First of all, thanks for joining us. What are the markets Absolutely. doing today around the, not only around the world, but over there in the UK? Well, I think you, you used the term chaos earlier, and that's sort of what we're seeing on a number of fronts over here. Um, the, the British stock market today dropped another about 6% on the FTSE 250, which is a measure of uh, sort of the wider British stock market. So that means that since Friday, it's down approximately 12% overall. The U.S. stock market, I'm looking at the numbers now, has dropped about 3.5% since Friday. So while that may seem like a small number, that, of course, represents billions of dollars uh, for, for average citizens like you and I. So, yeah, we're seeing absolute um, chaos on the market. The only upside, I would say, is that as an American, things have gotten substantially cheaper here in the past few days because, of course, the pound has dropped substantially against the dollar, and that means everything is a bit cheaper for American tourists. But that's not to make light of what is a quite a serious situation. Yeah, what about the U.S. markets uh, here this morning, Bradley? What have you learned by looking at some of those uh, numbers, um, you know, on a Monday morning? Of course, you're about eight hours ahead. So what have you, what have you learned? Yeah, well, I mean, again, the U.S. The US market's only been open a few hours. It's down about 230 points um, at the moment. So it, coupled with the 600 points it lost on Friday, again, that represents about a 3.5% drop of the um, overall Dow Jones Industrial Index. So, yeah, we're looking at a very substantial drop, um, not as substantial as what happened in Britain, where in the first hour of trading, actually, on Friday, after the results of the vote were sort of became widely known or were announced, uh, the market lost about 80 billion pounds in, in half an hour. So, so we're talking about potentially catastrophic banking losses here. And the other thing of concern that people are talking about quite widely, in fact, I'm, I just came from a conversation about it um, just around the corner from where I'm staying, but it looks like this could be or have the makings of another 2008-type crash situation. Uh, there's a great deal of concern about the capitalization of British banks and, in fact, shares in RBS, the Royal Bank of Scotland and uh, Barclays were both suspended for a period of time today because they were dropping so precipitously. So the worry here is that we're seeing the beginnings of another banking crisis that could rival or even exceed what we saw in 2008. Yeah, Bradley, I want to put up a couple of full screens that you're not going to be able to see because you're on the phone over there from Scotland. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, Bradley Hart is live in Scotland on the telephone talking about Brexit. Let's put up the first full screen. And you saw it during the monologue. It's called Brexit Fallout. Kerry, go ahead and put that up so we can talk about it. Last Friday, Americans with a 401k plan lost an average of 3300 bucks in one day after Great Britain announced to exit the EU. Then put the next one up, Lloyds of London lost 30% of its stock, which means more than 300 billion pounds. 34,000 employees in the insurance industry could be moved out of the UK. The question I have for you, Bradley, is um, why? Why so much chaos just because Britain wants to leave the, U the, the EU? Why, why is there a, this financial chaos? Yeah, it's a great question. And one thing important to point out, you're absolutely right about the situation with Lloyd's. Lloyd's, in fact, lost another 8.5% of its share price today. So if you couple that with the 30% it lost on Friday, it's now it lost a substantial amount of its value, obviously. I think a lot, of, a lot of the chaos results from the uncertainty. I mean, markets obviously never like uncertainty. Markets are based on profits and delivering value to shareholders. So the fact that there's any form of uncertainty is obviously harming them. But also, the city of London, where these banks are based, has relied for a long time on having unfettered access to European markets. Mm -hmm. And if Britain does withdraw fully from the European Union, which, again, we can talk about what exactly that might mean, which no one's quite clear on right now, but if they were to fully withdraw, then, then those banks simply couldn't operate in Europe anymore. They'd have to be re-licensed or have alternative branches and things like that. So we've already seen a push by American banks, actually, to move out of London. Uh, I believe it was Morgan Stanley last week that announced that they're moving thousands of employees to Ireland as a result of that, which would remain in the EU, yeah. regardless of what Britain does, obviously. So, so it's partially the, the instability. It's also partially just concern about the, the value of the pound. I mean, obviously, the other concern here is that if the pound becomes too devalued, if it, if it drops too low against the dollar and the euro, then goods will simply become more expensive. 
And we would expect uh-huh. to see those kind of price hikes happening in, in average shops within the next week or so, depending on how, how weak the pound actually gets. So it's a great deal of uncertainty and also a great deal of worry about the future of these banks. If we do see another collapse of a bank, banking group like Lloyd's, which until recently was actually yeah. owned by the British government, then we could see a partial repeat of what happened in 2008. Bradley, this is, this is the one thing I don't understand about the market, and, and you're probably better tapped into this than I am. Uh, I'm not a market type of guy, but it's hard to, uh, it's hard to understand the market. Uh, but what, one thing that may, you might be able to shed some light on is when there is this uncertainty, uncertainty like there is right now in Great Britain, instead of the market shakeup and chaos and markets dropping, why don't the markets just stay stable until people find out what's going to happen. Why does it have to take such a tumble, such a drop? Why not remain stable, find out what's going to happen, and then go from there? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, what we seem to see happening is that money, or especially uh, people who have large amounts of money in the market, are moving that money into safer investments. So they're moving into bonds, or they're taking fully cash positions. Actually, if you look at bond yield, which is a good measure of how many people are, are dumping their money into bonds, which are considered very safe, those yields have dropped substantially over the past few days, meaning there's a lot of money that's moving into bonds, again, seen as a very safe investment. So it's people repositioning or, again, large shareholders repositioning out of stocks that they see as potential losers into what they perceive as more stable investments. Mm-hmm. What about Scotland right now? You're there in Scotland. Donald Trump was there over the weekend. Scotland has already decided, no, nah, we're going to stay in the EU. But then when Great Britain decided, no, um, we're going to go out, we're leaving, is, is Scotland now, from what I'm reading, rethinking their position right now? Oh, without, without doubt, yeah. Um, yeah, Scotland is, is a fascinating case because Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU. Now, this has a number of implications, right? There was recently a failed Scottish independence referendum about two years ago uh, where voters were asked, did they want to leave the, the Great Britain and become their own country? And that was rejected by a fairly substantial margin. The latest polling that I've seen since Friday indicates that if that same uh, question were asked again, most Scottish voters would now vote to leave the UK and actually become part of Europe. So, so yes, Scotland is a very pro-European area. Um, you know, being up here during the referendum, it's been quite interesting because most of the talk that I've heard from just sort of people around around the city type thing has been very pro-EU. There's a great deal of, of consternation about this, as you can imagine. I- England itself, the sort of southern part of Great Britain, voted overwhelmingly to leave, except for London, which voted to remain, uh, and Scotland voted to remain as well. So there's a huge divide. It's a very divided country. The other thing that's important to note, I think, and this is a conversation I had earlier in the day, actually, was that this was not an overwhelming result. You know, 52-48, that's a substantial victory. If this were a, a yeah. presidential election, for instance, we would say that's a convincing win. But on a constitutional referendum question, that's really not that big of a victory. So one of the questions that's being asked is, is, is this really a large enough result to take this dramatic of a step, or do we need to be more incremental about it? And what's come out today is that, in fact, it looks like now Parliament itself will have to act. So the referendum will not be enough. We will have to go back to Parliament with the same question, and then we'll see what Parliament does effectively. So the pressure is mounting, actually, to try to either reverse or mitigate this referendum result in some way. Right. Hey, I'm, re- I'm reading in the papers here and all over the Internet that this was a decisive win by the Leave campaign. The, the, the members of this Leave campaign, they're the ones that wanted to leave the, uh, the EU, kind of speaks for itself, 52 to 48. I don't consider that a decisive win. It was actually kind of close. But who are these people uh, uh, that, are, that are part of this Leave campaign? Who are, are they young? Are they old? Are they disgruntled? Who are they? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, yes, you're, you're right. I, I would not describe it as a decisive win either. I think 5248 is quite close on a question of, of this significance. Again, in, in an election where you're voting for individuals, that would be probably a decisive win. But with a question like this, I, I don't think that represents necessarily an overwhelming majority of opinion. Uh, the Leave campaign from, from the exit polling and the demographics we've seen tended to be older voters for the most part. It's a, um, so, voters who are less affluent, tended to be less educated, um, and, and largely lived in rural areas. So people who perhaps haven't felt the effects of the European Union or haven't worked in industry being in the EU to, to their personal prosperity. But the demographics are very clear. The more, the more educated one tended to be, the more likely they were to vote to remain. Hmm. 
And so now we're hearing that uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, is going to resign maybe September, October. A new one's going to come in. And I, I've read a little bit about this character, Boris uh, Johnson, who may replace him, one of many people, I guess, up for the job. Uh, who is this guy, Boris Johnson? Is he kind of like a Donald Trump of Great Britain? Yeah, that's really the comparison that's been made. He's, he's a larger-than-life figure, uh, cuts a very distinctive profile. He's sort of blonde-haired and has sort of a, a messy hairdo type of thing. Um, a very, very humorous speaker. Uh, in fact, quite shrewd. Uh, is frequently underestimated by his opponents um, as being sort of a buffoonish type character. And in fact, one sort of uses his persona as a, as a political tool. He is one possible contender. He was quite outspoken when it came to the uh, Leave campaign. He was the de facto leader of it. But within the Conservative Party, there was a substantial split. There, there was a faction in the Conservative Party that included David Cameron and, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, essentially the guy who runs the Treasury, that was in favor of remaining. And so that faction of the party will remain formidable, even though they've lost this vote. Those, they will still have a voice, effectively, in choosing the next leader. So it's really anyone's guess as to what's going to happen in the Conservative Party. And, of course, now, in the past day or so, we've had a crisis as well within the Labor Party, which is the opposition party. So simultaneously, we appear to be having a breakdown of, of the economic system in some senses, or at least a crisis within the markets, with a major political breakdown. And that is actually quite a dangerous combination. Bradley, you've lived over there uh, in Great Britain. You know the lifestyle, you know the people, you know the economics, you know the politics inside out. I'm reading the New York Times yesterday, and it says here, and I, I'm going to quote you what the New York Times said, the economy aside, the United Kingdom itself now faces a threat to its own survival. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think there's almost no doubt that if you think of the U.K. as, as being constituted by Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, which are the four legal bits of it, there's almost no question that if this actually does go through, then that entity will no longer exist. There will be no more United Kingdom. There might be a country that exists by that name, but it will not include Scotland, and it may not include Northern Ireland. This is another important question, because, of course, Ireland has a thousand-year history of, of strife, and certainly um, as of you know three decades ago, there was still effectively an ongoing um, terrorism and violence situation there. So Northern Ireland voted to remain as well. And so the question will be, will we see an attempt by Northern Ireland to join with the Republic of Ireland, or will they try to break away from the U.K. as well? And that opens up a whole other Pandora's box of factional rivalries and all sorts of things. Yeah, and a couple of other questions here before I let you go. In fact, if you're just joining us, we're talking to Bradley Hart the Fresno State. He's a professor out there in the journalism department. He's over in the great uh, U.K. Uh, writing a book right now, another great one. And um, But actually, he's talking to us from Scotland because he took a side trip over there. He's been over there all weekend long with Donald Trump and all the rest. Um, i got to ask you this. Is this about stability versus change? Is that what this is about? That's a great question. I mean, no, no one quite, I think, has a grasp of how to interpret this result yet. Um, the, the polling bears out certain things that people were concerned about immigration issues, mass immigration, um, freedom of movement within the European Union, where under, under the current system, if you are an EU citizen, you can effectively move to any country in the, in the entire EU with, with minimal paperwork, minimal yeah. difficulties type thing. And that had, of course, become become an issue for a lot of voters. Uh -huh. um, but, but we don't really know. I mean, I think the, the best assessment that I can read on it is it was, it was simply a, uh, a middle finger being given to the political establishment in a lot of senses. <laughs> um, and, and what's interesting as well is that we've seen a lot of anecdotal evidence, perhaps not polling data, but evidence that, um, in, in fact, a lot of people who voted to leave didn't think it would actually happen. They voted that as a, as a protest vote, and now some of them apparently regret it because they didn't actually expect this to, to take place. Yeah. I, I imagine a lot of people maybe in England right now are waking up and saying, oh, my God, what have we done? But one final question, and we'll let you go here, and that is, how is this Great Britain vote, 52 to 48, to exit the EU, how will this affect our presidential election come November? It's Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is in favor of the old school. You know, she's old school. She likes stability. Donald Trump represents those that are disgruntled, far less educated. They want change. They feel left out of the system. Uh, how will this play out in this country come November? 
Well, this is the million dollar question, of course. Um, and of course, Donald Trump was here actually on the day the referendum was announced. I, I did not happen to see him, though we were both in, in Scotland apparently at the time. Um, <laughs> But, no, this is a million-dollar question. I, I think it could go either way. I mean, obviously, um, you know, Trump took some credit for this, actually, and just went on social media and sent out email blasts saying, oh, I, I called this and I was right and this is a great thing. But on the other hand, I mean, it, it's hard to disconnect the fact that he's taking credit for it with the aftermath of this. If this aftermath turns out to be quite yeah. negative, then, then we'll see how he plays that effectively, yeah. too. So, so it's a great question. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. I mean, I certainly wish that I did. Okay. All right, Bradley. Uh, did you cut out? Or are you still there? I'm, I'm here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Gee, you know, I really appreciate your time. We got to go because we got to talk about the Pope uh, visiting Armenia over the weekend. Another huge story, historic uh, visit over there. Uh, you'll read about the well. My kids and grandkids will read about this in the history books. But you know, after interviewing you today and talking to you today, I'm wondering in my own mind, why don't I have you on my show more often? <laughs> Well, I don't know. As soon as I'm back in town, we'll have to make it happen. All right. All right. Our very own Bradley Hart. Thank you so much for your time, Bradley, and stay safe over there, and uh, good luck on writing that uh, another book for you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hopefully. And, and thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Anytime. All right. Bradley Hart on the telephone live from Scotland reporting about Brexit and the great exit by Great Britain to, well, they decided to leave the EU. There'll be a second referendum. Maybe. We'll see how that affects our election come November. And our thanks, by the way, to Dennis Hart for, you know, he's been in here, what, more than 50 times. He helped hook me up with his son, Bradley Hart, today over there in Scotland. We're back with the second part of our program, the Pope. Pope Francis over in Armenia talking about the genocide. Back in just a few minutes with our two guests live in the studio. When you like Ventura TV Appliance on Facebook, it's nice. But when you love the KitchenAid appliances we deliver, it's even better. Our website is cool and it's a good place to start, but you really should touch the merchandise before you buy. Save big with KitchenAid. Right now, get up to a $1,000 prepaid MasterCard when you purchase select KitchenAid appliances. Get the best selection, price, and service in town without waiting. Come in to Ventura TV Appliance and touch the merchandise today. At 2020 Optometric, your vision is their focus. Whether you're 5 or 65, Dr. Thomas Casagrande will get to know you, your lifestyle, and vision needs to ensure that your contacts or eyeglasses are a perfect fit and the right prescription every time. With the Valley's largest selection of eyewear, 2020 has over 2,000 frames, including top designer brands like Coach, Tiffany, Prada, Ray-Ban, Oakley, and more. Eye exams start as low as $89, so call or stop by to schedule your appointment today. If you have a need to promote your business or event, please consider MeTV Fresno for your next campaign. MeTV reaches over 100,000 of your potential customers in the Fresno area every single week. Plus, you can rest assured that your commercial is running in the greatest family-friendly programs of all time. MeTV Fresno delivers a strong, loyal audience ready to buy, and your campaign will cost a fraction of what you're paying for your advertising now. Call me today to find out how affordable MeTV is at 905-1925. Giddy up with westerns, we've got the best ones. Superhero sci-fi spin, grab the popcorn and stay in. Dramas, mystery, and action, take a look and see what happens. Carol, Andy, Lucy, Mash, timeless comedies full of laughs. Hey, that's me! That's me. That's me, Chief. Yeah, me, me, me. Me, 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 you gotta see. That's memorable, that's me. Me, 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 me. Take a look at this. Let's play. This is too hip for y'all. Slow down. Let's play. Watch all your favorite classic game shows on Buzzer TV, KBBC Digital Channel 13.7.
Revan is now on KBHF Channel 4.4. Ventura TV Appliance Center. We're the save energy, save time, save money place. The Energy Star qualified number one rated high efficiency Cabrio from Whirlpool Place. You heard right. Right now, save big on select Whirlpool Cabrio laundry pairs and pay no interest when paid in full within six months. At the hometown low price, think outside the big box place. Since 1951, Ventura TV Appliance Center, we're working hard to be your place. When you like Ventura TV Appliance on Facebook, it's nice. But when you love the KitchenAid appliances we deliver, it's even better. Our website is cool, and it's a good place to start. But you really should touch the merchandise before you buy. Save big with KitchenAid. Right now, get up to a $1,000 prepaid MasterCard when you purchase select KitchenAid appliances. Get the best selection, price, and service in town without waiting. Come in to Ventura TV Appliance and touch the merchandise today. After God created the world, he made man and woman. Then, to keep the whole thing from collapsing, he invented humor. <laughs> Sub, a perfect reason to rejoice. A distinctly positioned channel in the crowded Hindi general entertainment channel space. It is India's only family comedy entertainment channel with a core brand promise of Asli Maza Sab Ke Saad Aata Hai. Which means celebrate the joy of being together. Taking humor as a universal language, the shows on Sub are light-hearted and make up for an enjoyable family viewing experience. Indeed. Sab TV is now on digital channel 31.8. Welcome back to the program and our thanks again to Bradley Hart talking about Brexit. Now time to talk about the second topic here uh, on the program. Connect with me on MeTV Fresno, sponsored by today, Dr. Thomas Casagrande of 2020 Optometrics. There is no question that Pope Francis, wherever he travels, he is treated like a rock star and for good reason. Call him the progressive pope in so many different ways. There he is right there, the picture of Pope Francis. And now you can add his visit to Armenia over the weekend as one of the most memorable times ever. This is going to end up in the history books. My kids and my grandkids will be reading about this. Over the weekend, Pope Francis used the word genocide to describe the killing of more than one million Armenians over, over well, just over 100 years ago. Turkey rejects that term. Nonetheless, the pope added the word at the very last minute during a speech at the presidential palace in Armenia, even though he had never planned to use it. But at the same time, Pope Francis called for Armenians around the world to reconcile with Turkey, whose people there claim the genocide didn't happen, the death figure was inflated, and that people died on both sides as the Ottoman Empire collapsed after World War I. Take a look at this video of the Pope in Armenia.
Live in our studio right now is Jim Grant, representing the Catholic Diocese right here in the city of Fresno. We're glad he's here. And Mark Sharon, the owner and CEO of Ventura Broadcasting, which owns this program and much more. Mark is not only Armenian, but he's lived overseas in Lebanon. He lived there for quite a number of years. He is here to share the Armenian viewpoint. I'm not going to go to commercial. I want to spend some time talking about the Pope. Jim, good to see you. How are you, you, my John? friend? Very, very Mark, well, nice you. to see you. Thank you. Yeah, so. Who wants to kick it off? Mark, this is a very decide. historic visit uh, in my mind. Go ahead. You know, we're, we're, we were, as, as an Armenian, uh, I was honored. And, and several times during the, uh, the visit, I was brought to, to tears. It was so emotional, uh, the Pope's visit to Armenia. Uh, this is not the first Pope that's visited Armenia. Uh, but this Pope uh, has struck a chord uh, with all Armenians, young and old. And uh, not only has he um, broken the mold uh, and, and done unprecedented things, uh, uh, these have brought, um, how should I say, uh, has, has endeared the Pope to not only the Armenians, but, but, but the Catholic world in general, and even non-Catholics. You know, I mentioned in the monologue, I'll have Jim comment about this, uh, I called him the progressive pope in so many different ways. Am I, am I right about I know people are using that term progressive, but it's the only term I could think of. I think one way to look at it is as the welcoming and countering pontiff, pope. What he is is the pope who wants to encounter the world, go out there and embrace it, and bring the world to embrace itself. What he did in Armenia over this weekend was phenomenal. It was something he had wanted to do. It is something that he already has a tremendous personal affection for the Armenian Apostolic Church mm -hmm. and a friendship with Karakin II. It is a wonderful, wonderful event, not only for the Armenian Church, but for the whole Catholic world. I read in the paper and on the internet that the Pope decided to use the word genocide at the last minute. It was not scripted. It was ad-libbed. He threw it in at the, at the very last second. Mark, your reaction being an Armenian. And before we do that, Carrie, can you run uh, the videotape uh, called Crowd Welcoming the Pope? We'll talk over it. There's no sound on this. We'll just uh, speak over it. Mark, your reaction. Well, actually, we, we kind of anticipated that, that, that the Pope would use the word genocide. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't know when he would use it or how he would use it. Um, this is, uh, by the way, uh, what we're seeing on, on screen is the uh, His Holiness uh, Pope Francis and, and uh, Catholicos Catechine the uh, second. Uh, and I think they're, uh, I think that is the uh, proceeding into the uh, um, the, the Republic Square of Armenia where they held a ecumenical uh, and, and uh, service for peace. But, but getting back to your question, we didn't know when it would happen. We just knew that he probably would because he had said it a year before in the Vatican, in St. Peter's Cathedral, which had a lot of weight. Uh, and he basically said that the, um, that the, uh, the genocide was the first genocide of the, um, uh, of the 20th century. Um, and, and, and this time he referred, had similar, had similar uh, verbiage. Yeah. Carrie, I want to also roll the videotape. Driving through Armenia, the Pope driving through Armenia, uh, greeting the people there. This was a phenomenal visit because a lot of people not only were able to see the Pope, that's not actually, that's actually, is that the right video? I think that's, when that's he's his arrival. Yeah. yeah, that's the arrival, but I, I don't know if he's actually driving through in that video there. There he is getting off the plane, but I, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that he touched so many people in Armenia and he asked for reconciliation. What do you think about that, Jim? He said that Armenians should reach out to the Turks and say, okay, we need to reconcile this. I, I think what the Pope did was so prophetic. He was able to list the event for what it was. He called it genocidio. He was able to say that everyone could understand his Italian genocide. To label it there in Armenia, which he had already said, as Mark said earlier in the, mm -hmm. in the Vatican, but then to remind the world that he is not a divisive person, but rather a reconciler, he challenged the people of Armenia and the people of Turkey to, come to together? please understand that at this time in history, religion needs to be a reconciling force. He challenged not only 
uh, the Catholic world many times, but he challenges all faiths to look at the best that they can be, and he did provoke in the Turks a bit of a discontent, but that is the Pope's style. Yeah, I want to roll the videotape called Driving Through Armenia, if we have that queued up, because I want to see him going through the streets of Armenia and being greeted by so many people that were able to shake his hand and talk to him. And Mark, reading so many articles in the paper, I read one article where there was an Armenian fellow, kind of a, I guess, middle class. There he is in the Pope Mobile. He said it was the dream come true for him to shake the hand of the Pope. Being Armenian, what does that mean for the Pope to come there and be able to shake his hand? Maybe somebody who's never even left the country of Armenia, you never know. visited anywhere else, and here this worldwide religious figure comes in, and not only is he able to see him, he's able to shake his hand. Um, Got to be very exhilarating. Yeah, you can see with the, with the crowds out there during one of the one of the um, appearances, there were fifty thousand Armenians out in the streets, and 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 I might. M m point out that typically the Pope doesn't share the Pope meal with anyone. And and in this case he shared it with, oh, yes. with His Holiness Kadi King yeah. II uh, mm -hmm. and and felt and treated him as a brother, an an, an equal. Um, and and I think that's significant. But uh, I was listening to some interviews of people young and old after the um, the uh, the ecumenical service in Republic Square, and it was amazing what we heard out of the lips of kids all the way up through, you know, grandmothers. And they were, they, I think the common thread is they're really uh, happy that the Pope visited a very small country, a mm -hmm. country that's not really considered a significant world power, and he spent three days of his time, uh, and he, he worshiped with the people, he comforted the people. Uh, you're going to see a scene up upcoming where where after one of the um, uh, services he actually embraces a multitude of of, of, uh, disabled. of disabled people, oh, and that was just uh, just I mean it brought tears to my eyes that this man took the time and he embraced. He didn't just give him a quick you know pat no, on the head or, no, or, each, or one. each one he 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 showed respect. <coughs> And and uh, and and showed that fatherly um, love, um, and I think that's what made uh, the Pope so endearing to the Armenian people. Yeah, you mentioned the handicap, and Carrie, if you could look for that video, the Pope is with the handicapped people. It's called Pope with the Handicap. I want to roll that videotape, and maybe Jim and, and Mark, you can pick this up because, like you just said, Mark. Yeah. Um, not a pat on the back. He spent some time with those people, and we, we, you know, I don't want to use the word handicapped. You know, I want to disabled, uh, disabled, or um, physically challenged. Perhaps uh, we want to be politically correct here. Let's roll that videotape when we have it queued up. There it is. Uh, is he with the handicap there? I don't think that's the the right videotape. It's got a large crowd. I uh, think right that's that, the the actual the hand. This is the handicap. This is the this handicap. Is the this handicap is, this is after that 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 public. Um, the the public um, uh, prayer service at Republic Square, so that's mm -hmm. why there's so many people there. The ecumenical prayer service was so moving, and what was so impressive is not only that there were some some uh, presentations, but the music and the prayers that were offered, the readings, and then to have it close as so typical of the Pope to be able to reach out to the public. He is one who would not want to just be a functionary. But the most important thing I think about this trip, which Mark said very well, the personal relationship between the um, Catholicos Karakin II and Pope Francis is such a fraternal bond that they are working together so much towards church unity. It is a motif that the Pope used often. He was so able to be there at a, uh, at a divine liturgy with the uh, Armenian Apostolic Church, and then his brother, Katholikos, was present during the Latin liturgy that the Pope celebrated also. There was an effort to bring the churches together. Did this bring a lot of people to tears, Mark? A lot of Armenians here in Fresno. You know, it's hard to tell 
I know it, it did for me. Um, I wasn't viewing with, with a lot of people, so I, I really don't know. Uh, but I'm sure they were all impressed um, and spiritually moved by, by, by the compassion that the Pope showed and also the, uh, his, his brotherly love that he showed to Catholicos Catechin II. Um, and, you know, his, pres uh, his presence at the Armenian liturgy, that's, yeah. that's, that's not normal. Oh, yeah. I mean, typically the Pope is present or presides at, at Catholic liturgies, but, but not typically uh, would sit at, at the altar of a non-Catholic uh, Mass. Yeah, I want to roll the videotape. It's called Pope Speaks at the Sunday Mass. I don't want to run the sound on this, Carrie. We'll just talk over this. Pope at the Sunday Mass. He's speaking there. Jim, I need to ask you, is the Pope a political figure? Is he a religious figure? How would you categorize it? Oh, I think the Pope, like all people, has to be political. There is no way that any of us can have an identity that isn't political because it means we are of the city, we are of the world. The mm -hmm. Pope has made an effort to raise that idea of being political to not be something that is ideological. And he's made a major point that Christianity can't be an ideology. Mm -hmm. It has to be a way of living. And his, this embrace is so significant. It is so important to see him mm -hmm. embrace people and ask for the blessing. He asked that the Catholicos would please bless him. This is something hmm. that, that can't be overestimated, how important this personal love, one for the other, is leading us to heal the wounds of centuries in the Middle East. In fact, both of these pontiffs we're, we're making us aware of the agony that is going on in the Middle East at present. Mm -hmm. They both spoke of it, and they both said that there is more <laughs> suffering and persecution going on to the Christian world in the Middle East now than perhaps ever in history. But by combining our love and our affection, we can move forward with some effort to heal and to reconcile. I like a reaction from both of you on this, and that is, why this visit to Armenia, and why now? Before we get there, while this tape's still running, I think your viewers okay. might, might sure. want to know, know where we're at. Yeah. This yeah. is on the grounds of Holy Etchmiadzin, that would be the Vatican of the Armenian Church, and it's a special altar dedicated to uh, uh, Saint Dertad, um, who was the king who embraced Christianity for the first time. Uh, in 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 3001, and that's an that's an outdoor um, altar, and it, it was also the place that the, um, the 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 sanctification or or the uh, the canonization of of the saints took place last year. The uh, the the martyrs of the Armenian genocide were canonized on that on that same altar. And you've 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 been there. You've seen the altar. I have not seen the altar. You've not no. to seen the no. altar, but uh, it is a very holy place, obviously. But why this visit now, and why the country of Armenia, which is a small country? Mark said it's not a superpower. This is a strategy of the Pope. So if we're talking about is the Pope political, uh, the strategy of the Pope is to build up solidarity, especially with those that are more isolated, that are more marginalized, and therefore he is choosing his countries, he is choosing his cities of visit very precisely. And when he goes to a certain place, what he does in that place is always very significant. So therefore, as Mark said, choosing Armenia, which might seem a small country, it mm -hmm. is in the Pope's mind a major connection it's not that this is something that is, well, it's just a small place. It is the beginning of what is his effort to reach out to those who are needing to feel the love of the church, especially at this time, because the, what is going on in the Middle East and what the Armenians across the Middle East are suffering, which does get celebrated in the ritual where they brought sand, uh, earth, from many places where Armenians are dispersed in the diaspora. And they put that in a beautiful 
uh, replica of the Ark of Noah and the children bring in this sand and they put it in and then the, uh, the uh, Catholicos and the Pope put water together to bring a future that will be different than what is the present. I'd, I'd like to pull up another piece of videotape, but Carrie, it's called Holy Water and Soil. Exactly this what you're talking the about. Moment. Holy Water and Soil is uh, at Noah's uh, monument there, or it, it might, am I reading it's, that it's correctly? Right, it's right after the the uh, the public square. Uh, Roll it. Um, there is that it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's a replica of the Noah's Ark sitting on top of Ararat Mountain, Mount Ararat, and the okay. small uh, Masis. Okay. And in it is a grape vine symbolizing the uh, very uh, important fruit for, for, for ancient peoples, and that is the grape from which uh, the wine that, that is used in the Eucharist uh, is derived. So the Armenians have a special affinity for the, uh, for the, for the, for the vine. Um, and what's, what you don't see in this video is prior to His Holiness Francis and His Holiness Karakin, watering this particular vine you can see in the background those little kids yeah. that are dressed in, in in ethnic costumes those are ancient Armenian ethnic costumes each one of them had mm. a soil from a part of the Armenian diaspora yeah. when I say diaspora after Armenians were forced out of their homeland they migrated uh, as refugees to places like Iran like Lebanon, like Jordan, um, Syria, Syria especially, um, and Egypt, and all around those those areas, and each one of those little vases contained soil from from all these uh, diaspora locations, and each one of these kids, uh, one by one, put the soil in, mm -hmm. and then and then after all the soil was added to the vine, then the two um, hierarchs basically watered that. Uh, and I think that is one of the gifts there that's going back to the Vatican uh, for, for uh, with with uh, with Pope Francis. Yeah, I I, I want to roll another piece of videotape. There, uh, he, there we, he's, uh, he's, oh, he's he's actually uh, put, hang you know, on, shaking stay, hands with the uh, with stay the with president it. president of, of of Armenia, the Republic of Armenia. Wow, Serge Sarkisian. Uh, he was wow. there almost at every event that the Pope was, including and and His Holiness Karakin II was also present at many of the the. Uh, uh, like the mass in Gumri, which was a mass of uh, the Latin rite, which uh, uh, which Jim pointed out, he was present at that. So they all yeah. honored his uh, schedule and and were with him throughout his his trip in in Armenia. All right, now we can get out of this, Carrie. And I I, I want to roll something that uh, would bring anybody to tears, and that is the Pope at the Genocide Monument. Oh, yeah. Um, no sound on this. Uh, we'll talk over this and get some comments here. 436, Me TV option 11. I failed to give the phone number out, but uh, call in. We have a few minutes, quite a few minutes left, actually. The Pope at the Genocide Monument. Let's roll it. Let's take it. Let's talk about it. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's gut wrenching. It's heart wrenching. Uh, to see, I, I mean, think I this one is mis mislabeled, uh, John. Perhaps this is not it, Carrie. It's, the, the, called, it's at the Genocide could, Monument. But we could we could talk through this. This is okay. this is actually the the monastery of Horvirab, meaning a deep dungeon. Okay? okay, and it is located on the border of Armenia and Turkey, in the shadow of Mount Ararat. Wow. <laughs> It's a very beautiful place. And this is where St. Gregory the Illuminator, the patron saint of the Armenian church, was imprisoned for 13 years in a dungeon. <coughs> and then this, this place of worship and, and, um, and pilgrimage was built on top of that dungeon. Okay. And, and this um, is one of the last um, acts that <coughs> were there together. And then, and then they released two doves symbolizing peace and, and, and those doves are, are directed toward Mount Ararat. All right. Um, did you find that video, Pope, at the Genocide Monument? Let's, let's take that and roll that, because I do want to talk about it. And Jim, I want to... And that's it right there. Yeah, that's it right there. Jim, go ahead and comment about this. Um, this one, uh, I did not see this live. I did not see yeah. I'm looking at it for the first time, but it, I don't know if I'd have seen it live. It would have brought me to tears. Well, I, I'm looking at it again because KNXT <laughs> was able, because of a feed from... Uh, Catholic TV in Boston, we were able to show all of these clips 
that we're seeing now. So when I saw this, is, it that, was, the, is that the genocide monument right there? Oh yes, okay. this is reminding us of where the um, His Holiness, the both uh, Holiness, were there together, and it was very somber. It was a very, very a solemn event in which a lot of silence, and then some very. Um, very can yeah. you can you bring music on this one? Do you want to bring the sound up so we can hear that? Go ahead, play it sound full. It was. Very somber, as you can imagine. You know, it was funny, um, not funny, but it, 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 I think it, it was, everything's planned in these type of visits when, when, when a major church leader uh, visits a foreign country. But what was significant was the emphasis on the Middle East and the unrest in the Middle East and the refugee, worldwide refugee crisis. Two of the bishops that serve in Syria <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> were front and center during the, uh, <coughs> during the liturgies and had active roles. Go ahead, Jim, pick it up. <coughs> One thing that was so significant is the blending, I think, of the Latin <coughs> and the Armenian churches and the effort that there was repeatedly, as Mark said, to have these two um, churches at different liturgies ecumenical services, uh, rituals, even um, presentations, that there was a complete embrace of the hope that by being together in spirit, the Armenian Apostolic Church and the Roman Catholic Church will keep moving towards a type of a unity which the Pope has made clear is not defined in any way yet, but it is an aspiration based on gospel texts that were read during these days. From John, the idea of being united, and from Paul, being that we are the body of Christ. He made a beautiful allusion, the Pope did, at the suffering of the, Ar of the Armenian people, being a suffering that the Catholic Church also suffers in. Hang on, and caller because it is the sufferings of Christ that we are suffering together, but not only suffering together, we are also going to be glorious together in the Lord's resurrection. So it's a very beautiful ca thought. Caller, I'm so glad you called. What's your question today? Uh, either one of your uh, 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 people might uh, be able to answer maybe how close do you think that uh, reunification with the Latin church is uh, uh, possible? Is it uh, getting closer or, or not? Good question. Thank you very much for calling. You know, I was just looking for the quote that the Pope made after the, or during the Divine Liturgy of the Armenian uh, Mass that was held at, at, at that, uh, <coughs> that outdoor uh, altar. And he said in, in, in that he said the following: Unity must not be the submission of one to another or assimilation, but rather the acceptance of all gifts that God has given to each. Let us pay heed to the younger generation who seeks a future free of past divisions. Um, he's talking about a different kind of unity. Um, I think he's talking about the unity of the cup, where, where we would would share yeah. in the in the communion, which which didn't happen this last trip. The, the Armenian Church and 
uh, which is part of the Oriental Orthodox uh, family of churches, uh, one of five churches, has been conducting dialogue with the, with the Roman Catholic Church for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And they meet on a regular basis and they hash out certain things. And, and what becomes very apparent is what, what uh, is common about our two churches uh, far exceeds what's what's um, the differences. The, the differences between yeah. our two churches. So, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think he, he he's not talking about an administrative union, but mainly a spiritual union. And, and may, John, yeah. um, uh, uh, Jim, maybe you can <clears throat> talk. I'd about agree that. entirely with Mark. And then at another moment, when he was speaking to the president and others, when they were speaking at the uh, assembly of the ecumenical prayer, he did say. Unity does not have to do with strategic advantages sought out of mutual self-interest. Rather, it is what Jesus requires of us and what we ourselves must strive to attain with goodwill, constant effort, and consistent witness in the fulfillment of our mission of bringing the gospel to the world. So in a sense, it is much more um, a companionship, a commitment, to be spreading the gospel together, and that is something I think. Um, are, are you talking we would about about crossing over and 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 taking communion at the Catholic Church? And if you're Catholic, you can go to the Armenian Church or the Greek Church and take communion. Is that what you're talking about, or a different kind of unity than that? We have just about a minute and a half left. Go ahead, pick that up, anybody. I, I think that's what the Pope is desiring, and 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 uh, and like I said, it, it and what Jim said, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean a submission to the high, to the administration of the of the the Roman papacy, because we are, we're an autocephalous church. We have our okay. own. We've had our own own church head, and we're apostolic like the Catholic Church so just like Peter and Paul for the for the Roman Catholic Church we have Thaddeus and Bartholomew so we've been uh, you know a, an independent church for many many years I think the Pope is asking for yeah. let's 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 talk about our common uh, commonalities and and let's enjoy the cup together, I, together I am Greek Orthodox I grew up taking communion in the Greek Church but I have to admit I have taken communion in the Catholic Church my ex-wife is Catholic my girlfriend is Catholic, and I have taken communi communion in the Catholic Church. Is that right or wrong? You know, I Mark am. Mark is laughing. I'm not a canon. <laughs> we got thirty. We yeah, got thirty seconds. Not a left. canon lawyer here. I'm not so. No, I, I, I would I, not know. But okay. I really would like to almost close on Mark's thought. Go ahead. Thirty one, seconds. One thing that sometimes <laughs> frustrates people is, is that what to, the Pope wants, though. Oh, I think what what the what Mark said is what the Pope wants. Okay. A unity of spirit a unity of gospel commitment, and if it gets to be that they could share the cup and the bread at the same Eucharist, yes. that would be already a major step forward, which on this yeah. visit, they were not able to do. I don't want to get cut off, but, but, but Jim, but, you know how happy I am to see you. Thank you, John. You're a good man. Do, do Mark? we have another, another half thank second? Half uh, second. <laughs> no, according to Marcus, okay. no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I apologize. Yeah. I don't want to get cut off and get in trouble by me TV. But Mark, it's good to see you. Thank you for your sharing your thoughts on the Armenian point of view. I appreciate it very much. That's going to do it for us here on Connect With Me. See you back here tomorrow with a brand new gym focused on female health and fitness. Watch that program tomorrow. Have a good day.